The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to AWCI's webinar. My name is Tao Nguyen, AWCI's Education Program Manager. And today's webinar, Understanding the Uses of Densuite Interior Products. This webinar is sponsored and presented by Georgia Pacific Gypsum. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Attendees should be on mute throughout the whole presentation. Should you have a question at any time during today's broadcast, please submit it using the question box in your GoToWebinar dashboard. Handouts and slide deck are available for download in the handout tab. And a recording of this presentation and all handouts will be sent to all registrants within the next couple of business days. At this time, I would like to introduce our two presenters, Wyatt Green and Colin Vaughn. Wyatt has 15 plus years in the construction industry in various roles, currently serves in the Technical Services Department of Georgia Pacific Building Products. He has been with Georgia Pacific for five years and enjoys being a resource to the building community and speaking about GP building products. Next to him is Colin, started his career building homes for 10 years after graduating from Purdue. He has spent the last 13 years in technical sales for GP. Colin is a BEC Indiana committee chair, CSI in Annapolis board member, CDT course instructor, and a member of IBEC and ABBA. Welcome presenters. Thank you. Thank you. So to start us out, um, we're gonna kind of go through kind of how we got here. Um, how do we get to Den Suite Interior Gypsum products and kind of what was the innovation and the idea around it? And um, we'll we'll focus on three different uh, products and I'll go into what those are. But before I do that, there was a, uh, a product that kind of spawned um, the, this interior suite of um, uh, Gypsum products. And uh, that was on the outside of the building. So um, Den's glass, exterior sheathing, um, it was created in 1986, and um, as it came out, it's ASTM 1177 was the basis of what you would look for in the spec, and it was going up against ASTM C79, which was paper-faced sheathing. Um, that drastic change between the materials that are being used had an early adoption by architects and contractors within the first five years of the product's history, mainly because it only takes one bad situation um, for everybody to want uh, to switch over to a superior product. And what this was doing is it was based around the 12 month exposure warranty. So um, that 12 month exposure warranty allowed general contractors and the whole project team to coordinate and uh, alleviate issues, but it also further expanded the designs and the cladding systems that are allowed to be used in buildings because you had that longer exposure period. And so fast forward to today, um, we continue to innovate. Um, now it's an exterior system. This does not replace Dens Glass as a product. It's an alternative to it, but we still make Dens Glass uh, exterior sheeting. But the Dens Element Barrier System with Dens Defy products is an integrated water and air barrier sheeting system. What this does, it consolidates the sequencing of the sheathing and the barrier installations, like your weather barrier, air barrier, into one product or one system. So why'd this come about? Well, it's optimized for both offsite and on-site on -site wall assemblies um, for incre incremental weather conditions. It's also great for um, the aspect of helping out the schedule sequence, helping out how many trades and who can be on the job and when can your brick installer come or when can your cladding guy come but the really nice thing about all of this is it's single source manufacturer for the sheathing and the barrier accessories because on the exterior of the building you might have 16 different manufacturers in a typical wall so by consolidating this on the manufacturing side you're also consolidating all the finger pointing that kind of thing so that's kind of a brief history on the exterior of the building but as you can see, this is a timeline of the Den Suite interior products. And in 1986, like I said, Den's glass sheathing was uh, started. But in just two years later, the Den Shield tile backer, which uh, Wyatt will go into in depth on that, uh, as well as the Den's glass shaft liner, 
uh, in 2001, and then a year later, the Dens Armor Plus Interior Panels lines. And uh, we'll talk about those three, but just wanted to show we've been innovating in this space of fiberglass mat gypsum boards for over 30 years. Um, and this is something that uh, uh, here at GP, we are very passionate about and we see can provide a lot of solutions. And one of those solutions is in the scheduling. And we'll, we'll touch on this throughout the presentation, but anybody that's been a part of a project or a construction project knows what you're looking at. You're looking at that Gantt chart. And we like to think of these products as Gantt chart smart. Um, and so when you're thinking about what essentially makes this Gantt chart smart, it's the flexibility of sequencing. So by allowing different trades to be on project, you can get to your critical path uh, of that um, uh, project and all your different milestones. So if I'm eliminating essentially the need for a contractor to wait for something else to be done, I can essentially lower my cost as well as up my production. And we all know that labor savings is a huge thing and anything that we can do to help our labor force because that's under critical, critical supply right now. And so if we're helping that out, what we're going to do overall is be Gantt chart smart. And, um, you know, as far as the, um, the, the way that this all comes together is you can't just jump ahead and schedule and just say, oh yeah, it's all fine, is you have to assist in the aligning of the QA to QC. And what I mean by that is QA is quality assurance and QC is quality control. If you are a contractor, your responsibility per the construction documents is the quality control and you have to align that to whatever the designer or the architect or the engineer has specified as in the spec in quality assurance of part one, part two of the spec. And so by doing this, by aligning all these different things uh, within these product values, we are going to help you eliminate some of the concerns that you might have in the quality control. So going to our first polling question, just to get you warmed up, um, polling question one, what is your role within the construction industry? We're just trying to get an idea of who we're talking to today. Are you A, a residential contractor, B, commercial contractor, C, architect or specifier, D, consultant or E, manufacturer? <clears throat> Give you a second to pick. Okay, a couple more seconds. Okay, the results. All right, so we got 38 commercial contractors, 29% architect specifiers, some consultants, and also some manufacturers. So no resis today, no residential guys, but um, Great to know that we've got a good mixture of uh, different providers and, and solution contributors. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off over to Wyatt and he's gonna touch on the Dens Armor Plus interior products line. Thank you, Colin. All right, so as uh, Colin mentioned, um, the Dens line is, is made up of numerous projects. Um, for this presentation, uh, we're going to be focused on uh, three that are, are primarily used on, on the interior or only used in the interior. The first one of those um, is Dens Armor Plus uh, High Performance Interior Panels, um, which are fiberglass mat faced on both sides of gypsum panels. Um, some of the value that they provide um, to a project um, and why you use it um, superior uh, moisture resistance uh, compared to using uh, alternative uh, paper-faced uh, gypsum, gypsum board products. Um, and it's primarily used um, for what is referred to as pre-rocking, um, using it uh, or installing on the inside of the building before the building is fully dried in. So before the windows are in and before the roof is on, having the glass mat, which has a superior bond uh, compared to paper and the high mold resistance, um, makes it a, a great product that can help keep the project moving. Um, it can also be used in mechanical rooms where you have a lot of penetrations. Uh, we're going to look at an example of what I mean by that. 
and also in corridors where there's a lot going on to be able to go in before the buildings drive in um, and get um, some production going on um, in the gypsum board scope of work. Um, Dins Armor Plus is available uh, in half inch and five eighths inch thick, uh, thicknesses. Uh, the five eighths inch thickness we refer to as fire guard. Um, it's uh, designated as a type X uh, gypsum panel product. Um, so it's available in numerous uh, fire rated assemblies as well. So Dins Armor Plus, as I mentioned, is a, a fiberglass mat on both sides. Um, the fiberglass mat will have a superior bond um, a pull off resistance compared to, to paper face products. And the moisture resistant, uh, the core itself is engineered um, to be, uh, have greater water resistance uh, compared to alternative products as well. Uh, it's been tested um, in accordance with ASTM D3273 and it has uh, received a score of 10, which is the, the highest uh, that a gypsum panel can receive. And so I thought that this was a, a good picture. Um, you can see your, this picture is standing uh, in the exterior on the site, you know, looking into the project itself. Obviously, it's far from, from being dried in. Uh, the exterior walls aren't, aren't completely framed yet. But you've got some rooms and then some top out happening in the background there, um, with, being done with Dins Armor Plus. And uh, one of the advantages of Dins Armor Plus is that it's backed um, with limited warranty against delamination and deterioration for up to 12 months uh, up to normal weather conditions. I was mentioning that superior bond that that fiberglass mat has compared to paper products. Um, so installing before drying in and topping out. Um, so it helps really keep a project moving. You know, if you go through a particular rainy period, you know, helps reduce that risk of having to redo work again, um, which can be expensive and time consuming. Uh, this is another example um, that I had mentioned earlier, um, using it to pre-rock um, or top down or topping out of a corridor. So in corridor spaces, right, there's a lot going on uh, above the seam level as far as what goes in there, you know, as far as MEP equipment kind of crowding out that space. So being able to get in there early you know, before the buildings dried in um, and get uh, the gypsum board up. Um, so that way you can have clean cuts um, through these uh, partitions, especially if they're fire rated and, and maintain your fire resistance versus going, the alternative going in afterwards. Um, and one thing that I wanna mention, um, so you can see that it was installed um, in the ceilings of this corridor and that is absolutely fine, um, but it's also important um, to take note of, um, if it's gonna be going in before the building is totally dried in, um, do not allow water to pond uh, on the Dins Armor Plus interior panels, you know, especially in those horizontal conditions. So this picture um, is obviously in an in a electrical room. Um, you can see that the, the panels were put in, there's nothing in there yet. So just getting them in and keeping the project moving. But you know, being able to go into an electrical room or, or a mechanical room where you're going to have lots of, of uh, conduits or, or ducts um, penetrating the walls, being able to go in and install uh, the gypsum panels um, early on um, and have that 12 months of exposure to allow these trades to come in afterwards I and mean, install what they need to install um, and keep moving and, and not hold the project up. So next, um, I'll hand it off to Colin for our uh, second polling question. Great, thanks. So polling question number two on Dens Armor Plus high performance interior gypsum panels. Dens Armor Plus interior panels has a fiberglass mat facer. Can it also be used as an exterior sheathing? A, yes, just make sure to finish the joints and fasteners. B, no, it would cause issues. So you got a 50-50 chance. I'm a poor test taker, but I think I know the answer to this question. Give you a couple more seconds. Ooh, got, got a little bit of uh, some, some, variation here. So 32% said yes, 
Um, and 68% said, no, it would cause issues. So Wyatt, you want to touch on this? Because I'm sure you probably get this as a tech services guy. You get this phone call every once in a while. Yeah, um, definitely. So um, no, it cannot be used um, in vertical um, exterior wall applications. Um, so just because it has a fiberglass mat facer and it um, resembles its cousin, um, dense glass sheathing, uh, it cannot be used uh, one or the other is an interior panel. Now there is an exception in that uh, Dins Armor Plus can be utilized um, in, in weather protected um, exterior soffits um, where you can finish the joints um, with either a, a gypsum base or cementitious base um, a base coat um, and then finish it out with a, a, some type of acrylic topping, usually a paint or textured finish. Thanks. All right. So next section, we'll move on to Den Shield. And Wyatt, you want to talk a little bit about the Den Shield Tilebacker line? Definitely. So um, Den Shield Tilebacker, as its name uh, implies, um, is a, a gypsum-based uh, tilebacker, um, fiberglass mat based, uh, similar to uh, Den's Armor Plus. Um, one of the benefits that uh, Dins Shield brings to a project um, is its ease of use and that it has the moisture barrier um, applied to it uh, during the manufacturing process so it arrives to your job site with the moisture barrier built in. It can be used in a variety of applications, um, so vertical walls, um, it can also be used in some horizontal locations, so countertops and floors as well. Uh, and like Denzummer Plus, uh, the gypsum core has been engineered to be highly moisture resistant. Uh, in addition to the coating that I mentioned to you that also gets applied, um, we'll take a look at here in one of these next slides. It's available um, in a number of thicknesses. So you've got quarter inch, half inch, and five eighths. So quarter inch and half inch can be used in horizontal conditions, and half inch and five eighths inch can be used on in vertical conditions. Um, the 5 8 inch has a fire guard designation as well, like Denzoma Plus, and it is considered a Type X uh, gypsum panel, and so it is also available for use in numerous uh, fire rated assemblies. Um, it's also available, comes in uh, different uh, cut uh, lengths and widths as well to match some common um, conditions um, or, or room sizes uh, with an effort to reduce the amount of joints that will that'll take place uh, during installation. So Din Shield Tile Backer has a heat cured um, acrylic coating that's applied to it um, at the plant when it's being manufactured. Um, the fiberglass, being fiberglass mat, it has a superior bond compared to paper fish products. And then um, as you can see that it's got that gray coating as well that helps uh, block out water and make it highly resistive, which would also be the side that'll face out and that would have tile applied to it. So here's an example um, of some horizontal conditions that you can see highlighted there in the picture on the right. So uh, quarter inch or half inch uh, thicknesses can be used for countertops or, or floor tile underlayments. Some common, the most common tools that you're gonna need is gonna be a utility knife. Um, the nice thing uh, about Vin Shield is that it can be cut um, at the work site um, by hand by a single individual. So you don't have to take it and bring it out to a saw to avoid kicking up dust where you're working. I'll be handled right there um, at the site where it's going near where it's going to be installed. Uh, modified uh, latex uh, Portland cement and mortar, um, the same that would be used to adhere the tile. Um, fiberglass mesh tape to treat the joints. Uh, corrosion resistant fa fasteners um, and a notch trowel in these horizontal applications. And so the, the floor and ceiling details that just came up here are, are out of our technical guide um, and just um, show kind of a, a quick. Uh, schematic of, of what it's like uh, to install these horizontal conditions. Um, they're very similar, whether it's a floor or countertop, you'll have your base, and then you'll have your uh, thin set applied onto the base, and then you would uh, embed the din chill on top of that. And from there, um, it's off to the races, uh, installing your tile for manufactured constructions. Uh, installing in vertical applications on walls, um, that's a half inch or a five eighths inch thick thickness and has a tile underlayment. Common tools are similar to um, the floor uh, or, or a countertop that we just reviewed. You'll notice one addition here that we have is a, is a flexible sealant 
um, that's used at corners where you've got thin shield uh, meeting each other. Um, and then typically along, say, the base at, at a bathtub receptor um, at, the, at the transition at the base of the wall. So this is a typical wall assembly um, showing you, know, you would install your dent shield tile backer um, over the framing. Um, you would apply your sealant um, where it meets at the corners and then along say the base of the bathtub there. Uh, you would treat uh, the panel to pan any panel to panel seams that you may have um, with your latex modified uh, Portland cement and your fiberglass uh, mesh tape. Um, and then there's no need to treat the fill to the wall because the fill to the wall already has that coating that was applied um, on it in the manufacturing setting. So how does a DIN shield tile backer compare to alternatives? So most common alternatives um, for tile backer would be either cement board um, or fiber cement board. There are others, but those are really popular ones as well. As I mentioned, uh, it cuts with a utility knife um, at the site, you know, where you're working. No need for a circular saw. Um, you don't have to remove it and go somewhere else. Um, it does not require a separate membrane to be trial applied uh, over the field of the wall um, to make it waterproof or water resistant. And the maximum stud spacing um, can be up to 24 inches on center um, versus, versus 16 inch on center. So a little bit more versatility with framing options. And now I'll hand it off to Colin to talk about some of the testing that then has gone through. Thanks, Wyatt. So um, testing, when you're thinking about tile backer, there's a lot of different things that we're going to be concerned with. Um, mainly, how's it going to hold up? So what's its durability, as well as how is it going to serve as a base um, for the tile that's going on? Is it going to bond properly? And um, is it going to kind of hold out that moisture within that tile assembly? And so this first one that we're looking at is the Robinson Floor Test ASTM C627. Um, and Dense Shield achieves um, the residential and commercial flooring usage ratings. But um, essentially as this test goes on, one of the things that occurs is it increases the weight and you kind of continually build that up. And, Essentially, what Den Shield tested to would be the equivalent of three refrigerators stacked on top of each other. And why is that important? Well, if you guys have ever walked through a commercial space, and specifically, I travel a lot. So one of the areas that I look at are elevators. And I challenge you guys, next time you go into an elevator uh, in a hotel maybe or something like that, look down. And the reason is, is a lot of times, you have a lot of flex in the elevator. Plus, you have a single point where people are stepping. So a very critical area to make sure you have a very durable substrate so that tile doesn't crack and cause uh, an unsightly view. The next thing that we're going to look at is kind of one of the unique characteristics of Denshield Tile Backer, which is the shower test. And within the shower test, um, essentially, we're looking to achieve that ability to eliminate the extra moisture barrier. Um, so if I'm using a cement board or a concrete or a gyp concrete board, um, any kind of combination of that, when those are thrown under a typical percolation test, which essentially is a stacked column of water, and as you see, uh, and as you test it over 48 hours, you wanna see how much water has actually transferred through. Um, with uh, the Den Shield tile backer, um, <clears throat> depending on um, the test you look at, uh, it is right around an eighth of an inch to two inches of water that's percolated through. Um, and then as far as a concrete or substrate board of any kind like that, it's around 43 inches. So a lot more water transfer through there, hence the reason why you wouldn't need a moisture barrier. But there are also some scenarios where we might call that out in our technical guide. But in this shower test, to pretty much explain and show, we, we hired an in, independent third-party testing facility. They built a shower wall with Denshield Tile Backer, added the tile, but didn't grout the grout lines. And so the parameters of this, you're gonna run this test for six months, seven days a week, 12 minutes each hour. And you're gonna hit it with 110 degrees Fahrenheit water, um, showered against that wall, and essentially, Per the uh, Tile Commission of North America in 2008, this is equivalent to 12 years of normal usage for a shower wall. 
The results of this were no deterioration occurred to the framing members, the wall cavity, or den shield tile backer. Now, if this test was done maybe with a concrete board or something like that, we're not saying that the concrete board would have a failure or have any issue. It might be the framing members and wall cavity behind it. And that's the real critical thing with this test is that we're, the den shield tile backer was able to prevent the framing members and wall cavity from having any sort of deterioration uh, within this testing parameters. And uh, a pretty significant call out for this product line. So the next polling question is on den shield tile backer is what side should face out when den shield tile backer is installed? A, the gray coated side, B, the fiberglass mat side, C, either side is sufficient. <clears throat> so now you have a one third chance in getting this right. Give you a couple more seconds. All right. So 45% said the gray coated side, 45% said the fiberglass mat side, and 10% said either side is sufficient. Wyatt, can you help us out here? Well, good job um, to those who selected A. Um, so the din shell tile backer is going to show up to the project site um, with the gray coated side, and then the, uh, the other the back side would be the fiberglass mat side. So the gray coated side is the side that should face you, and that is the water resistive coating um, that will receive uh, the finish that you're going to apply to it. All right, we'll move on now um, to um, this is the the last product um, that we're going to talk about, um, and it also um, is utilized in, in two different uh, wall assemblies. Um, so dense glass shaft liner um, is used uh, in area separation walls um, and shaft walls and, and stairwell um, assemblies. We're going to talk about those independently. Um, it is a, a one inch thick um, fiberglass mat um, gypsum panel that's got um, pretty significant uh, fire resistance. And also, um, again, since it is a, a fiberglass mat um, uh, product on um, front and back, um, it has a, a moisture resistive core as well, so it's highly resistive and um, can withstand uh, you know, being exposed to the elements for a period of time you know, before the building is dried in. So it's only available um, in one thickness, and that's a uh, one inch. Um, so they're two feet wide, um, and typical panel lengths are uh, either uh, 10 foot um, or 12 foot long. Um, common alternatives um, in shaft walls um, and stairwell systems are going to be uh, CMU um, or concrete. Um, however, you know, if the building's uh, structure allows for it, um, utilizing uh, light gauge framing and uh, gypsum panels um, like the, the dense glass shaft liner, um, is, a, is another alternative um, to utilize. Some of the advantages that it has um, is that it allows for a single side um, or room side installation. So that's different than other, uh, most other gypsum assemblies where you need to have someone on, be able to access both sides of the wall um, to complete the assembly. But the way that the framing components um, are manufactured and these are all, these are friction fit um, and the entire wall assembly can be completed from one side. And we'll take a look at that here in the next slide, what I mean by that. Um, it is, uh, in my opinion, relatively simple. Um, it requires uh, the gypsum panel um, and then two steel components, your track and around the perimeter and your studs. Um, it does offer a cost savings compared to CMU or concrete. Multiple hourly fire rate assemblies uh, are available depending on the needs of the building as well as uh, multiple sound tested assemblies um, that can achieve uh, varying levels of STC performance. So examples of some assemblies are from one hour uh, up to three hour. And I want to note, so you'll see kind of the, the, there's for the one hour, the two hour and three hour, there's an assembly on the top and an assembly below it. Um, what that is showing, that the assembly along the bottom is showing what the sound tested assembly is. And a lot of times, you know, it includes the addition of insulation. So that's what you're 
looking at. It's not necessarily one, a one hour, two hour, three hours, not two runs of this. Um, it's just showing non-sound tested to get the fire rating or sound tested if you want that STC performance. And there's varying levels of STC performance. For one hour assemblies, it's 40 to 44 STCs. Um, and then for two and three hours, uh, you can get up to 54 STCs. Um, it's also available as well in, in up to um, a two hour uh, horizontal shaft wall assembly. So for verticals, you've got one to three hours. And then for horizontal uh, enclosures, where it's going to say wrap a duct or, or something that's horizontal that needs that protection, you can be available up to two hours of protection. And looking at the components that make up the wall, um, you've got your two framing components, uh, your, your J tracks, which would be utilized around the perimeter um, of the wall assembly, and then whatever stud is selected, whether it's CT, CH, um, or I studs. Um, that the, the gypsum pan, the one inch gypsum liner will be friction fit in between. And then on the room side, you would come in with your traditional half inch or five eighths inch uh, paper faced uh, or glass mat faced uh, gypsum panels. So that makes up um, the, the shaft wall assemblies. We're going to move into uh, talking about area separation walls, and, and Colin is going to lead that off. So when Wyatt and I were talking about this topic initially, I came to this topic and started to cringe a little bit, mainly because, as you heard in my bio, I was a home builder for a little bit, and I did some townhomes that had some area separation walls. And um, <clears throat> in that time, um, you know, we're here in Indiana, and I guess anywhere in the Midwest can say this right now, is like, if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute. And um, uh, my framing crew was getting ready to do this, and they put up the area separation wall, and um, we didn't have a uh, fiberglass coated uh, or fiberglass matte gypsum board. We just used a paper face gypsum board and got a little bit of moisture in there. And uh, none the wiser, we were like, no, nah, we're fine. It'll probably just evaporate out. It's a hot summer day. Um, come to find out because the home builder that I worked for had a five year warranty um, on stud to stud. So essentially anything that, you know, nail drywall pop or anything like that, I got called back to this and opened this up and it was black mold everywhere. Um, it's a dark space. It's pretty well conditioned um, weather-wise or temperature-wise. And with that paper face, it was a, a saturation and uh, you know, had the f fuel for food um, for, the, for the mold. And so um, that's one portion of this, but the real key portion of this is fire safety. Um, and so when you're talking about an area separation wall, this picture is the best one I've found um, out there right now. And essentially, this project is during construction and something caught fire in this single unit. And as you can see, there's two other units that are essentially untouched. Um, and the reason for that is, is the way an area separation wall works is that it has brake clips that will have that wall collapse in on itself. So it uh, essentially, in the design, allows us to better control the fire production that might occur to also eliminate the direction of fire into new fire sources or new fuel sources that might be another wall, mother, uh, other cladding materials and that kind of thing. And so we're trying to isolate that. Very important in multifamily um, or in uh, a townhome or anything that's uh, resulting in how do I separate the risk variable for an owner or a tenant? Um, this is a really key thing. And the next most important thing to this is you got to know what you're doing when you're doing it and why it's going to detail what I mean by that as you go through. You can't skip certain steps. It's very important that you follow this um, and, and not throw the uh, instructions out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wyatt to kind of go through some of the alternatives as well as go through the system itself. Yeah, good points, um, Colin. Yeah, we'll take a, a deeper dive now here into uh, area separation wall assemblies. So um, area separation wall assemblies can be built um, with what we're about to talk about. Um, alternatives um, that can be utilized, say, before this was available um, would have been using uh, CMU or masonry. Um, or you can also um, use uh, two one-hour walls um, in between um, dwelling units as well of, of traditional, quote-unquote, traditional built um, gypsum, uh, fire-rated gypsum assemblies. 
um, between the two living spaces. So this picture on the right uh, is a mock-up um, of building an area separation wall um, going up between you know, what would be um, two uh, independent dwelling spaces or townhome units. Um, there's height limitations, so air separation walls um, are built um, from slab um, to roof, the underside of the roof sheathing, and vertically and horizontally exterior wall to exterior wall. Um, for uh, Georgia Pacific air separation wall assemblies, um, we have designs both through Intertech um, and through UL. For Intertech designs, the maximum height um, is 68 feet, um, and the maximum height in UL is 44 feet. Now, they are uh, non uh, load bearing assemblies in that um, they will not support any structure or any loads imposed upon them from the structure but they do have to be able to support um, their own dead load um, as they're stacked upon themselves, as most townhomes are, are multi-story and require multiple lifts um, of the air separation wall to be built on top of each other. Um, solid, um, two inches. Um, so they take uh, two layers uh, of the one inch uh, a shaft, shaft liner. Um, and you also must maintain a minimum of three quarter inch of unimpeded airspace. Um, if you can see there um, at the floor line, you can see there's a bit of a gap. Um, you have to have a minimum of three quarters of an inch of, of airspace where nothing else can be between uh, the air separation wall uh, and the next closest uh, building material. So next to, um, once you get beyond that three quarters of an inch, there's um, a flanking wall um, that will be built that we'll look in the next graphic. Um, and that is where um, electrical and plumbing components um, can be placed. Um, it's important to note um, that with the air separation wall that's shown as, as in this photo, um, no penetrations are allowed through it. It must be um, completely independent. Uh, the dwelling units must be in, completely independent of each other. So looking at um, this uh, graphic here on the left um, does a good job of uh, kind of doing a, a cutaway, um, looking at independent townhomes or two separate townhomes. Um, here, uh, the first detail is at the roof ceiling. Um, it's important to note that the, as I mentioned earlier, it goes from slab to underside of the roof sheathing and it must be in contact um, with the underside of the roof and you don't want any gaps. Um, at the exterior wall, same thing, it needs to butt up against horizontally exterior wall um, to exterior wall. And um, at floor intersections, um, you've got some fire blocking that's typically required by code. It's not part of the air separation wall assembly, um, but code does require fire blocking um, within that three quarter inch airspace. Um, as I said, that's a minimum. Um, one popular piece of material use in starting on the job site is those one inch shaft liners. So you can have a one inch airspace. Um, using that um, will ensure that you have that at least minimum three quarter inch airspace if you use that as your fire blocking material. And then here um, at the wall to slab, you've got, um, as you start building the wall, you know, one thing that, that we recommend um, is, you know, setting uh, your fire blocking material there uh, along the base of the wall to establish to make sure that that gap is maintained, um, whether it's one inch of shaft liner or a minimum three quarter inch uh, of some other uh, code approved fire blocking material to maintain that three quarter inch airspace. In looking at a little bit more of a, a detailed um, cutaway, you can see kind of all of the, the components you know that go into the air separation wall. You've got your uh, two inch air separation wall assembly there in the middle, and then you've got your flanking wall framing um, on each side uh, of the area separation wall. And that is what provides lateral support um, to the area separation wall assembly. Um, you've got your H studs, um, which are uh, friction fit. Um, the, 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 one in, or the two one inch shaft liner panels are friction fit between the two. And you've got your back-to-back C-track -back um, at uh, the, the next lift. So the back-to-back C-track -back is used around the perimeter. And then you've got your H-studs. And then you've got your uh, aluminum uh, angle clip, um, a lot of times referred to as a, a breakaway clip. Um, and it's important that the proper material is used, that it's an aluminum angle clip. And the reason that some people refer to it as a breakaway clip um, is the design 
of these uh, air separation walls is that um, the picture that we first looked at where you had a building that had been on fire and collapsed that Colin was talking about, um, the design, the way that that's allowed is the structures on fire, when that structure eventually collapses, the aluminum clips are going to be heated up and they're going to melt away and they're going to allow the building to fall, including the flanking wall on the fire side without pulling down the air separation wall, leaving the non-fire side uh, of the townhome, uh, of the townhome that doesn't have a fire occurring, um, protected, the air separation wall stays up because the flanking wall on that side will have clips as well, providing lateral support to it. And that wraps up um, the presentation of the, the three DENS products. Um, this is our, our last uh, polling question. I'll hand it off to Paul. Thanks, Wyatt. So eight studs uh, and back to back. It's not, we have one more extra back in there. So just back to back C track form the same shape when laid horizontally. Can I just use H studs at that condition or are they interchangeable? Yes, simplify the installation and reduce materials on the project, or B, no, it needs to be built per the specified design and to the tested assembly. We gave you a 50% chance on this. Give you a couple more seconds. We need like some question music, like Final Jeopardy. Should have thought of that. That's a good idea. We'll add that next time. <laughs> <laughs> you can make your Black own mustache and yeah. glasses. <laughs> All right. So 14% said yes, 86% said no. Wyatt, can you add to this? Or why? Right. Yeah. Answer? So, um, the correct answer is B, and let me go back um, to my last slide to help better paint a, a, a mental um, image. So this is a, a common question that we get here in, in tech services where installers, usually they get called out by a local code official. So, you know, this is a floor line. So you've got a run of your air separation wall coming up from below. And what you see here is this is a new run of air separation wall being built on that uh, air separation wall below. And what you're um, supposed to do, and if you read the design um, out of UL or out of our tech guide, um, you cap um, the row below with the C-track, and then to start your new run, you turn that C-track upside down, as you can see here in orange, and then you start your new run. Um, sometimes, you know, if you look at the profile of a back to, imagine this back-to-back C-track, Installers, you know, will look at uh, this H stud and say, you know, that's a similar, you know, profile, and it's only one material. Um, you know, usually they think it's more efficient, and they go ahead and do that. But that is not, you know, per the design. You know, usually you'll get called out, you know, by your code official. Um, and you know, the reason that it's important to do that is one, that's the way it's tested. Um, the other is the C track is a different dimension, so the C track um, is a little bit wider. Um, and the up flanges or the legs um, are a little bit taller um, than the H studs. So it's designed to, the C-Track is designed to have the H stud, you know, fit into it as well as the two inch line of pants. If you use H stud in lieu of back-to-back C-Track horizontally, um, you're not gonna have that width, so you're gonna have to force in the vertical H studs and you're gonna typically end up damaging the panel itself. So you're gonna have to have a couple corrective actions of, you know, correcting, using the H stud horizontally and then the damage that likely occurred to the panel when it was forced in because the ends don't have beveled edges. Um, the ed I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, edge, the ends don't have beveled edges and the edges do that are meant to fit into the H stud. Hope that was clear enough. Um, the, only thing that, the only thing that I would add is also one of the things that your code official or AHJ is gonna call out, um, and I'm speaking from experience on this, is make sure your aluminum angles or your breakaway clips are clear. Um, one, they're gonna wanna see them because they're gonna wanna see, make sure they're positioned properly and that kind of thing. But two, any type of foreign substance that's on that breakaway clip will mess up the melting time. Essentially, 
thwarting all of the design and all of the efforts to make this area separation area separation wall operate properly. And so um, just like uh, when you're doing any type of uh, floor transition uh, walk through after your electrician goes through, your plumber goes through to make sure you got everything sealed off for smoke and fire spread. This is another thing just to kind of put on your checklist. Make sure you check this, make sure you look at it because it will get you dinged. And if you're not on the site when he's doing this, you don't have a chance to clean it off and then you get delayed. So one of those other kind of helpful tips, uh, speaking from experience, uh, but why, thanks. So that uh, wraps up uh, the, our presentation. Um, be happy to uh, take any questions that anyone may have. Yeah, so if you haven't submitted your questions, please do so now. Um, the first question is, what kind of finishes can be applied over Dense Armor Plus interior panels? So uh, Dense Armor Plus interior panels um, can receive uh, any of the same typical finishes that would be installed um, over say traditional uh, paper faced uh, gypsum panels. Um, you know, one thing that we recommend is that um, while the fiberglass mat itself is, is different than exterior fiberglass mat, and it's not as rough to make finishing easier, um, using, uh, if you're going to be uh, tape embedding and, and trying to achieve a level four or five finish, you know, using a, a high solids primer before you do that can help um, reduce the amount of passes that you take and to get to the desired level of finish. But it can receive tile, um, as I mentioned, traditional um, joint compound um, or adhered wall coverings. Could Dense Armor Plus be used in place of veneer board or veneer plaster application? Um, so, where so for interior um, uh, gypsum uh, plaster application, um, we would um, recommend um, using uh, the plaster board or sometimes referred to as blue board. Um, so on the fire rated assemblies, is each layer required to be taped? So that's going to depend on uh, the assembly itself. Um, you know, usually, there's a layer to be taped. Um, it would be the, the final layer if that is a requirement. But um, ref you can re refer to uh, your design listing. So typically, it's going to be UL design listing. So refer to the specifics of that. Some have that requirement, some don't. Um, if you're not sure, um, you can always call us um, here at Tech Services, and we'd be happy to go through that with you. So for Den Shield, what do you do at board to board joints? So at um, panel to panel seams, so you know we we do size um, dense shield to minimize the need for joint setups around. Um, so you may not end up with any, but if you do have um, panel to panel seams, um, you want to make sure that you use a, a fiberglass mesh um, joint uh, treatment as an alternative to paper, because if you're, especially if you're using it in a wet area, and um, the thin set, uh, the modified thin set cement um, over that joint, embed your fiberglass mesh into that, um, and then um, it'd be ready to receive your finish. So it'd be the same thin set that you're using to adhere your tile. Okay. For shaft walls, can the dense glass shaft liner be cut in half so it is 12 inches wide, so the studs can be placed spaced tighter to achieve higher limiting heights? Does it compromise the fire rating? Can you say that again? So for shaft walls, can the dense glass shaft liner be cut in half? So it is half or 12 inches wide. Oh, so like, can it be ripped down the middle? Yeah, so the studs yeah. can be spaced tighter to achieve higher limiting heights. So um, to achieve higher limiting heights, um, you know, that would need to go through um, a, a structural uh, engineer um, but to answer the question on if it can be cut, um, yes, it can be cut, um, you know, vertically, you know, typically um, that wouldn't be uncommon, say, like at the last section, you know, where you've got uh, the shaft liner, you know, budding, say, a concrete wall um, or ending in, you know, it's not the 24 inches wide. Um, so, yes, yes, you can cut it um, to achieve um, higher limiting heights. Um, you need to refer to a, a structural engineer. 
So does that um, compromise the fire rating if it does cut it to 12 inches? So, you know, cutting it uh, vertically, you want to make sure that you, you know, achieve as close to a straight um, factory ed or finish um, as you can. Um, and you do not want to have um, any gaps um, within, uh, between uh, the gypsum panel um, and the framing itself. Um, if after you cut it um, and you have gaps, um, I would contact us. Um, we're going to want to see um, pictures uh, of what you're dealing with and we can help um, you know, walk you through what the next steps would be. I would also say when, you, when you're cutting it, whatever method you're using to cut, it's going to be pretty critical because if you're just trying to do score snap, anything like that, um, you can get like what we call a doggy paw on the edge of the gypsum. Um, where you get kind of a ripple and you're gonna have to rasp that down first, but then you might be short in some areas and that kind of thing. Um, and so your quality kind of going back to that QC to Q or QA to QC, that would be my biggest concern if uh, if if I was a directive given to me as a contractor would be um, making sure I'm able to hit that uh, quality assurance um, with my quality control practices um, through the different tools that I have on, you know, ripping that down. And it's important um, to note, you know, when you're cutting um, uh, the the shaft liner, um, it is referenced in our tech guide. You don't want any pieces um, less than eight inches. So that is the yes. the, the, the minimum um, that you can cut it down to. Okay, this is in regards to the area separation wall assembly. Why is the three quarter airspace needed? So um, the three-quarter airspace uh, is needed to be maintained because um, the heat can still transfer through those H studs um, that we looked at. So there are um, steel, uh, obviously, um, and steel transmits um, is, is an efficient uh, heat transmitter. So what was found um, during um, fire testing of these is maintaining that uh, three-quarter inch airspace um, was able is what was needed um, to provide um, the rating that we achieved, which is two hours for those area separation walls. When you get start to close that in, um, you, know, you get uh, potential combustible materials um, close to that hot um, H stud material. Um, you, you know there are things that you can do. Um, say if if that three-quarter inch airspace is violated by putting um, half inch say type C. Uh, a batten strips um, over, you can do one inch shaft liner, um, you know, over those uh, H studs as well, well then um, you would be beyond that three quarter inch airspace. But when you can use batten strips, um, if, if that does happen, that would be a fix that would, we would take a look at if someone came to us and said, hey, you know, I accidentally built too close. Okay, last question on the docket here um, in regards to the area separation wall assembly. How do I protect mechanical or plumbing penetrations through the ASW assembly? Um, so, you know, it ties in um, to that last question. So when referring to the area separation wall assembly, that's the two uh, one inch liners of the DIN shaft liner, um, that cannot be penetrated. Um, now, the, um, whether it's an MEP, so mechanical, electrical, or plumbing materials, would need to be put um, in the flanking walls. Um, and then all of that material, including the flanking wall framing, would need to at least maintain that three quarter inch distance. Um, if, say for some reason, a, a hole is placed within it, um, say because someone cut a penetration through and, and didn't know, um, typically when we get those calls, it's after it's been called out, it's been resolved, say it was a pipe, the pipe's been removed, so now what do you do? Um, we would say, you know, contact us, um, you know, it's going to be dependent on, you know, where it is, the size, the condition. Um, we're going to probably want to see a picture of what you're dealing with and we can walk you through the next steps on, on how to fix it. Okay. That's all for the questions today. Thank you, Wyatt and Colin, for your presentation. Thank you, thank Georgia you. Pacific, for sponsoring this webinar. And thank you to our attendees for attending. Um, please visit awci.org education for upcoming webinars and events. Thank you, everyone.